as always, I very much welcome. As always, I very much welcome uh, anybody's feedback and questions as we go, and we're going to go from there. So it's been an interesting. Um, it's been an interesting twenty-four hours, hasn't it? To say the least. So I don't know how many of you have attended. Um, I think it was a premium webinar the the last go round that we spoke, and um, we highlighted a couple of things that we were likely going into a deflationary period. So I want to what I want to do today is I want to run through because what's happened is the trades the trades happen now we kind of. Now we're in this situation of, well, what's next? There's a war going on. But I don't – that's the funny thing is that the the data was leading all of this to the point where we even got short Russia about six weeks ago. That thing's down 36%. And that was more in the case of we're going to see a rate of change slow down, and that'll – you know, that's going to translate to short. Anyway, so <clears> – <throat> um, Let's have a look see here. So those of you know that I like to we'll just get a fresh piece of paper and go to it. I like to look at the economy in sort of four stages. And I'm gonna run through this very quickly because I've done this a few times. Okay. So one of them is uh, the reflation, the reflation trade. All right, this is where um, you have growth going up and inflation going with it. All right, and this is largely what we saw in Q1 of last year and Q2. This is where all your garbage stuff goes up. The AMCs, the GameStop, the meme stocks, all of that stuff, the garbage, crypto, you know what, coin, all that stuff goes up here, all right, during this reflation phase. Inflation going up and GDP growth going up, all right? And I want you to remember this stage because it's all the things here that got us bullish in this period. I'm talking... March, April, May of last year before the Delta variant. Okay, all the things that got us bullish there are now got us bearish now. All right, and the title of this webinar is How to Trade the Deflation, the Slowing Growth, Slowing Deflation Trade. All right, but we have to understand how we get to anticipate where the economy is headed, then we can put on the necessary asset allocations relative to where we think it's headed. All right, so then we have the Goldilocks phase. Okay, right. and this is, oh, sorry, that's rough. This is growth going up. Okay, and inflation coming down. This is really where you see sort of your blue chip quality stocks do well, not a lot going on in the bond market. Uh, central bankers are doing a whole lot of nothing, if not easing slightly to bolster the economy. All right, and then you have stagflation here. So this would have been your August, September of last year. Okay, and Ready for the most part, what we saw pre-pandemic was stagflation, and this is growth going down and inflation going up, okay? And this is where the things that perform here are your mega cap stocks, uh, Apple, the true quality stuff that the true quality, you know, the rock worlds of the world, those companies that have strong earnings to debt ratios, <clears throat> the true quality 
of the world do well in stagflation. All right, and <clears throat> generally you'll have interest rates actually coming down as inflation goes up, and you will have commodities going up commensurate with this inflation. All right, now, the next part of this is deflation. Okay, now, like I said, it's the opposite of reflation. So this is when growth is tanking and inflation is dropping. And this is what we in now, deflation. All right, now I realize that the narrative is for inflation, and I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that here in a minute. All right, but remember, and this is maybe the big takeaway from today's webinar, all right? Two things. One, the only time the dollar gains strength is in deflation. All these other periods, the dollar will generally be lukewarm or even bearish. However, the dollar goes up during deflation. Okay, that's, I mean, that simplifies your life all in itself as a currency. I mean, this is FX Street. I'm talking about the, you know, major asset allocations. But that makes things a lot simpler. Is backtested. The dollar really only goes up during deflation, which, you know, is interesting in and of itself and simplifies your life as a currency trader that if you get if you get the deflation right you're getting the dollar right and if you're getting the dollar right you're going to get your tech shorts your gold longs all of that stuff right makes life a lot easier okay and you know it doesn't this is irrespective of wars and narratives and whatever kramer okay the other thing um the other thing I want to mention here as a basis is the Federal Reserve uh, politicians, they care about a single point of data, all right? Us, as market participants, we care about rate of change, the rock, okay? This, for us, is all that matters. So it was interesting, I, I wouldn't say I got in a Twitter spat, that isn't what I do, but I put out the other day that GDP is likely going to go from six point what was it six point nine percent last quarter, and we on our way probably to two point eight percent given inventories, etc. The the Atlanta Fed thinks that we're going to one point two percent by next quarter. Well. This is a 60% rate of change decrease. All right, now you've got to remember that the numbers that we get, particularly GDP, the numbers that we get for GDP will be reflected next quarter for this quarter, right? They're lagging. All right, now what happened during March and April of 2021? I'll answer the question. Well, we printed up $1.9 trillion of fiscal stimulus. That's not quantitative easing. That's not through the banks. That's not buying MBA. That's fiscal spending. In other words, hey, Joe. Oh, Joe's like, hey, Fred, here is $1,400. Bucks. Hey, Susie, here is a tax cut for your kids. It's $3,000 and we're going to send you $400 check. So that is direct money in your pocket and that happened on March 11th. Okay, 2022. Hey Rob. That happened here. Okay, well, what, what are the components of CPI? C plus Oh, the writing is tough today. C plus I. A lot of guys would prepare nice, neat, nice, neat PowerPoints and things, but that's not my style. It's, you know, we're professional here. Yeah. All right, plus G, government spending. 
governments. So March 11th, you get 1.9 trill injected into the market. Well, we're about to get March data that has, and April particularly, that has to compare with this. All right. So you had earnings growth reported for the first quarter of 2021, S&P earnings growth of 73%. And end of the year, something like 34%. So the comparative of earning, the, com the comparative number that has been matched is that. 73. To give you some idea, core PCE for March, delivered an April number, was 26.4%. Core PCE is basically the health of the consumer. So in 2021, because remember the data that we get now is for, or in March, is for February and the data we get in April is for March, and those numbers are compared on a rate of change basis to what happened in 2021. All right, and it's that rate of change that gives us where we're going next in the market in terms of the economy. And where we're going next in terms of the economy then gives us our asset allocation relative to what the market's gonna discount into the future. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so, um, so core PCE of 26.4%, the rest of the year it dropped from there and we got eight, six, four, et cetera. And we like to go somewhere around the four, five. So the comparison is basically a 90% drop in consumer spending relative to where we were in 2021. And it's the same sort of thing. We're seeing the same sort of <clears throat> rate of change slowdown that actually peaked in November. We're seeing the same sort of rate of change slowdown in ISM supplier deliveries. Okay, that, <clears throat> or delivery times, excuse me. Meaning that, you know, delivery times were in, delivery times in October, August, September, October were two or three months. Those delivery times are now normal. So on a rate of change basis, we've seen delivery times slashed by 75% in some cases. ISM service is the same thing. I'll show you the chart. Um, ISM backlogs, the same kind of thing. So I like to look at PCE, ISM, consumer confidence, etc. Those are leading indicators as to what's happening at the producer level and the consumer level moving forward. And then we can make those comparisons through a model to project how they're going to comp relative to what they were this time last year. And that gives us our rate of change in their economy. The Fed only cares about a point in time. They don't do rate, they don't do rock. All right, so this, <laughs> I don't respect the Fed's ability to project but the economy, but I do respect the market's ability to do it. All right, and so now we have a situation where we have GDP that's going from 7.5% perspectively to 3% and perspectively 2.8% moving into the next quarter and certainly by June. So you have a growth slowdown of... 60% on a rate of change basis. And oh, by the way, the Fed's raising rates today six times. I call BS on that, but that's we can talk about that too. Raising rates into that. Because it would not surprise me in the slightest if the market took a 60% haircut from the top by June. I really don't know what the bullish case is for stocks, to be honest. I really, really don't. And this is before any of this Russia stuff. We've known about this. We've known about this. The Fed raising interest rates or threatening to raise interest rates pulled all this forward. I, 
I was telling clients that we're probably going to see a dip in January, then a rally February, March, and then just its head caves in in April, May. And what's happened is the Fed just pulled all that forward <clears throat> two months. All right, so let's have a look at a couple of things for inflation here. We live in interesting times. We really do. <clears throat> um. Let's talk about inflation here. <clears throat> this little newsletter I put out to our website, but I'm just going to bring it here. Any questions so far? And we're going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we're going to get to how we can trade this. I, I want to give you the backstory first, not to waste your time, but I want to give you the methodology before we, um, before we delve into how we can trade this forward. Okay, so what's interesting in the January CPI report, <coughs> excuse me, is, I don't know if you guys can see that, Let's see if I can, oh, that's all right, I'll just talk to you about it. So starting in January, the friends over there at the Bureau of Labor Statistics who run the CPR report okay, came in with something called, well, they're changing the weights of the consumer price index that we use to calculate CPI. A tiny little headline here, look. Look at them. A one-liner. Nothing to see. But this has monumental changes to the way that CPI is calculated, because there's no ways they can go to the public and actually report what's there. There's just no way. They wouldn't have a job. Okay, so <clears throat> what does this mean? So for the longest time, so for the longest time since the dawn of man, they have used three things to calculate the CPI. All right, they have hedonic adjustment, I'll tell you what that is, substitution, and then the sort of weightings system. All right, so hedonic adjustment is the following. You buy a car in 1990, and in 1992 they bring out a similar car, a similar brand, and it's a better quality. And it is $5,000 more than the equivalent car two years ago. But the quality is better. So they do not appropriate an inflation number to a vehicle or a product that is improving in quality, but the price is also going up. If the price goes up, in their estimation, commensurate with the quality improvement, then they appropriate no inflation to that particular product. All right, and back in the <clears throat> back in the seventies and eighties, they went from a cost of goods basket. So basically, they had ten goods in a basket: milk, bread, whatever, apples, a Big Mac, and they said whatever the cost of that is, however much it goes up, that's the inflation rate. Pretty smart, pretty simple. It worked. And then they said, well, that doesn't really work for us politically, so we're going to change our inflation to a cost of living index. Now they started to get creative with this number. Okay? And this, so they started to use something called the hedonic adjustment. This is this quality improves, price improves, price goes up, therefore no inflation. All right? Then they said, okay, well, that's fine, but what about substitution? And so what they do for substitution is as follows. 
let's say the price of ribeye steak is ten dollars a pound and the price of ribeye goes up to twenty five or twelve fifty a pound they don't say that the price of that steak has gone up twenty five percent they say well is there something else the consumer can eat oh you absolutely hamburger that's six dollars a pound brilliant that's 40 basis points less deflationary because they're able to substitute something else that they could possibly have consumed in the same sort of factor exposure. You see where this is going? And they've just sort of perpetuated this for 30 or 40 years. All right. Now, what's happened is inflation's got so out of control I actually think it's peaking in February, hence the deflation call. And that matters because that's going to determine what fixed income you get yourself into. All right. So now they said, well, you know, these supply constraints have really made things rough on us. Let's adjust a couple things. Okay. So obviously shelter being the biggest one. All right, shelter is about 33% of CPI. Um, I'm going to post this link in here. You guys can actually read. Uh, you guys, I'll put it here in the chat, and you guys can actually read this little report. It's quite an eye-opener, honestly. Okay, so here's what they did. All right, so <clears throat> they said that for right so what they do is they say okay well there's a hundred percent available for weighting in the cpi number and then they appropriate weights relative to that of what factors are going to be in the cpi number okay and in january in january they appropriated 13 Point three percent for food. Okay, and use cars four point one percent. You guys have heard this thing about oh, you use cars have really driven inflation. It's been Powell's thing forever. Okay, what's interesting though is that the price of fertilizer. Okay, fertilizer, which incidentally Russia is the world's biggest fertilizer producer just btw think about that with them sanctions all right now you've got to remember what fertilizer is you use fertilizer today that goes into the crop tomorrow okay that goes into the crop tomorrow that crop takes several months to grow then it's picked then it goes into the shop this is a shop Okay, and a lot of times this crop becomes food for animals. Uh, I'm not going to draw an animal here. We're going to put a box with four legs, you know, head. Okay, and this crop, and then this animal takes sometimes up to two years to go to the abattoir to be turned into food. So this fertilizer cycle lags. This fertilizer food inflation cycle takes a while to play out. All right, but we know through ISM that the semiconductor issue is coming to an end. The inventory issue is coming to an end. The <clears throat> um, the supply chain backlogs are coming to an end. We've seen it at the producer level in the data. So what do they do? So for January, we know that food is going to continue to go up because of this lag effect of fertilizer. So for January, they decrease, okay, so for January, they decrease the impact of food by almost one full percent, okay, but then increase the impact of used cars by almost one percent. So the stuff that's resolving 
resolving itself price-wise on an inflation basis, they give a higher percentage to, and the stuff that they know is not resolving, they give a lower percentage to. Isn't that something? Okay, and there's a lot more to it because there's something called CCPRU, and this means that they use these different weightings to calculate tax brackets for people and how they change the weightings affects how much taxes they're going to pay and it's estimated that they're actually going to people are going to pay approximately nine percent more taxes because of the way that they've changed the weightings of CPI that's fun okay but <clears throat> but the takeaway here is that the takeaway here is is that the inventory cycle is sort of resolving itself. All right, and what happened is what happened is is that a lot of the Q2 growth last year came from several years of durable goods spending being pulled forward, literally three years of durable goods spending being pulled forward. That then meant that the inventory cycle got behind the eight ball. That inventory cycle then grew dramatically. Okay, but now what's happened is inflation is killing the consumer. So these new inventories and the demand is now dropping, which means that the margins at the producer or the margins at the retail level are now getting squeezed. And oh by the way, we're raising interest rates into all of this. So I ask again, what exactly is the bull case for stocks? The growth is decelerating massively on a rate of change basis. The revenue growth is decelerating at a retail basis dramatically. The inventory cycle has caught up at the manufacturing level. Okay. Amazon reported banner earnings last quarter, but they've already told us this next quarter is going to be terrible, and that's why discretionary is one of our shorts. All right, so let's talk about that. So I hope you picked up a little something here as far as how I like to determine using, you know, the economy to determine where we're going next. All right, then it's a case of allocating with respect to that. All right, so what thing, what assets do poorly and what do well in the deflation environment? Okay, we'll drag this across. All right, so gold, the dollar, fixed income. So this one, you know, particularly the tens twos curve has got flatter and flatter and flatter. The, the Fed is absolutely going to invert the yield curve. It's going to be almost like 2,000 all over again. That didn't go well, by the way. All right. The worst commodity or worst sectors here are commodities. All right. <clears throat> but this is the one that I want to highlight. Tech. Okay. And... For the same reason on, let me go back to, uh, what do I do with that? This, when I go down here to the trade, these were the shorts that we've had on for some time. We knew nothing about Russia. This is short XLK, short Q, short Russia, and short um, Coco. All right, and long uh, staples, long utilities, long the dollar, long gold and long Canada, I mean, rather France, which hasn't done so great. Okay, and this is all based, these allocations were all based on knowing our economic framework and what performs within the context of that framework. All right, and then it was the same story. Here's the, here's the February note. I'm going to post this one too because there's a lesson in here. Okay, there you go. So <clears throat> this was this was February second, and it was the same allocation here. 
this is before any war broke out. Tech short, Hugh short, Russia short, Coco short. All right, and the same longs. And it's for a reason. All right, let's talk about that. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the market dynamics going on at the moment. Okay, the options market now has grown larger than the spot market. I don't know if you guys know that. So, <clears throat> so what's happening is, is that dealers, Citadel, State Street, etc., they have to hedge their options exposure is called delta hedging. All right, and what happens is, is that when um, <clears throat> we're not going to get too far into the weeds, but I do want to mention it just for your uh, education purposes. So what happens is, is that when the market's dropping it goes to something called short gamma, which basically means higher volatility regimes. And it's caused by the following, okay? When this, it forces options dealers to sell futures as the market drops to delta hedge neutral, okay? So this then causes higher volatility, which means that it, the volatility controlled funds, which most, most mutual funds are, have to then start selling and that forces options dealers to de-risk further and have to sell further. So it's pro-cyclical delta hedging. It's in the same direction as the market. It's very different to positive gamma where they have to sell into a rising market to be delta neutral. So you've got these dealers selling into selling markets to be able to hedge the options exposure and you get this sort of negative feedback loop that's where we get these flash crashes and things All right now there's one other component to this and this will tell you a lot about just the market and the market structure in general okay apple constitutes about six percent of the S&P 500. Microsoft, I'm sorry, Apple 7%, Microsoft 6%, Amazon 3%, etc. All right. With Nvidia, Facebook, Tesla, and Google, that is 26% of the S&Ps. All right. To put that in perspective, Coca-Cola occupies 0.6% of the index. Talk about Coca-Cola. Every movie back in the 80s with a tumbleweed out in the Nevada desert has a Coca-Cola fridge. Right? They occupy 0.6%. So in other words, 10x less than Microsoft in impact. So if Microsoft goes up 1%, Coca-Cola would have to go up 10% to have the same impact on the price of the S&P 500. Well, if passive indexation now is 65% of the market grown from 40% just a couple of years ago, remember passive index funds, they only have one mandate. When Joe goes to work and they say, where do you want your retirement fund in your 401k? He goes, I want growth. And Vanguard then has a fund that says growth, and it's basically a target date fund that says, oh, you are 25, you need this much equity exposure to retire when you're 65, this is your allocation. And their mandate is simple, it's you give me money, I buy. It doesn't matter what the price is. And then they go and ha they have to index themselves to these funds, so they buy proportionate relative to what the weights are, can you see how this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy? So if you start to get faulty with these, with tech, you can start to get some serious, serious, serious crashes because everybody owns the same stuff because passive indexation has grown, which means that to stay indexed, they've got to all buy the same stuff, but to get out, 
they all have to sell the same stuff. All right. So if we're going into a period of deflation, which another word for that is stock market crashing, they all have to sell the same thing to get out of the way. And this is why we've had tech as our biggest short allocation, particularly the Qs. All right. So <clears throat> tech, energy, you know, has not performed. We actually bought energy the other day. So this one, and that's the thing, is you can have an idea as to what should perform, but ultimately it's what, you know, the signal within the context of that tells you to do, and energy has just remained bullish trend. It's the same as utility has been garbage. That has not performed. But the things that have performed very well and will continue to, gold, the dollar, fixed income now, you know, the, they were pricing in seven rate. Because if the Fed gets to seven rate hikes, Goldman Sachs will not have a brokerage by the end of 2022. It's just madness. They are not going to get anywhere close to that. I've, I've told you how the economy is slowing dramatically on a rate of change terms. I mean, just government spending, we're going to spend $1.3 trillion less this year in the budget than last year. On a rate of change basis for GDP, that's a 6% reduction. But they're going to raise seven times. It's just mad. So every time the 10-year gets its nose to 190 or above 2, you buy the TLT. I'm telling you, <laughs> just, just do it. <laughs> because they're not going to get anywhere close to that many rate hikes. It's just mad. All right. And we're going to see a rally today, and you should definitely sell the Qs. If you want to do it through, if you want to do it through ETFs, SQQ, Q. Okay, that's your tech short. You can short XLK by TLT and SHY. That gives you your fixed income, your dollar stuff, UUP, and then your gold GLD. And this will get you through this period and make you some alpha. Energy is continuing to perform. I think we're probably pretty close to the top of that. But, you know, you can buy XLE on dips still but it probably will start to deflate by the end of the month. Obviously, don't put on these trades right here. They've just been ripping for the last couple of days. So be judicious, judicious with this, please. You know, I'm looking at NASDAQ even returning as close to 14,000. Um, <clears> you know, S&Ps somewhere close to even as much as 4250, 4280. So we could see some mammoth bounces here that'll send rates high, and you can put on all these trades again. Does that make sense? Anything high beta. And if you guys remember last month's and the previous month's webinar, we said we're going to have to have an awkward discussion on crypto because crypto gets killed in deflation. So, you know, crypto does fine in all the other periods of the economy, but deflation, I'm not touching that. It would, I mean, yes, over the next 10-year period, I think ETH is going to 20,000, but why do we have to wear that drawdown? Just let that thing collapse and buy it for peanuts. You know, June, July, I bet that we're having a discussion about, okay, on a rate of change basis, things are likely to improve. Remember that last year, that was when Delta hit and Delta was actually killing some people and people, we saw that big stagflation run where growth kind of tanked for three months, but inflation rose. So the economic comps are not as sticky for that, that middle part of the year, July, August, September. So we could see a nice ramp over that time, which will take crypto up, you know, probably something like a reflation, not a reflation, like a Goldilocks type trade. We have growth kind of growing a little bit, but inflation in check. So, you, you know, that's when we're going to buy tech and buy, you know, all the things. That we, basically, all the stuff we're short will be long again for three months. And the problem is the reacceleration from Delta, those comps hit for November, December, which means that we're likely going to see a second wave of down at the end of next year. 
and this is how I like to think about it. What is going to happen on a rate of change basis in the economy? How is that going to affect revenue growth? What does it mean for inflation? What does it mean for the inventory and business cycle? And then asset allocate relative to those things when the timing matters. And then also watching things like <clears throat> gamma and market breadth to time, are we in a negative gamma regime? Are we in a positive gamma regime? What are those levels? Okay. Are there any questions? I'm going to post um, a little website link here. It's a free sign up. You'll get the newsletter. You'll get access to the gamma stuff. There's no strings, no money. Knock yourselves out. Let's take a quick look at um, the Dow chart caught my interest this morning. Just because of this. You know, this was this like bugle thing we had going on. Um, and we're kind of right there now. I, I, you know, I'm still of the opinion that this is, <laughs> this is just the start of the bear, guys. So the company's name is Tier 1 Alpha, and we just do Gamma Breath stuff. It's a free sign-up. Go for it. There's no money involved, ever. Um, <clears throat> any of those meme stocks and things that you liked are all shorts. AMCs, GameStop, um, any of that hard beta stuff does terrible in deflation, just the worst. I mean, AMC can go to four bucks. So keep that in mind. All right, guys, if there's no questions, I hope that you learned a little something. And I encourage you to follow me on the twit at F-R-Y-E-X David, 4X David. I do update a lot of things there. If you have any questions, you know, shoot me a thing there or my email, david at tier1alpha.com, and I'll answer anything you have there. Always happy to help. Uh, this is a complex environment, and it requires being on our toes. But, you know, <clears throat> short tech, long TLT, long gold, long staples and we're about to get short commodities here in the next month those are a long way down all right so keep your head on a swivel and we will talk to you in the next iteration next month thanks